山雨欲来风满楼，新加坡总理忧中美关系。Countries like Singapore are not going to take sides in this U.S.-China contest. 美延长对华关税。Does there need to be a winner? If President Joe Biden was to do the right thing, the reasonable thing, and lift tariffs on Chinese products, he would be killed politically. 风云对话专访新加坡国立大学亚洲研究所杰出院士，新加坡前驻联合国代表马凯硕。九月六日，拜登向记者透露，如果中国国家主席习近平参加十一月在印度尼西亚巴厘岛举行的 G20 峰会，他确定会与他会面，因为中美之间的竞争每天都在变得更加紧张。近段时间，白宫不断放出消息称，美国正积极推动中美元首在 G20 峰会期间进行面对面会晤，但尚未达成具体方案。今年以来。中美高层已进行了多轮对话与接触，然而自八月初佩洛西窜访台湾后，中美紧张关系进一步升级。中方对美方采取了一系列反制措施，覆盖政治、外交、军事等多个领域。中美两个世界大国将如何加强对话、管控分歧，引发了多方关注。马凯硕，新加坡学者型外交官，新加坡前常驻联合国代表。曾担任李光耀公共政策学院创始院长达十五年，有“李光耀智囊”之称。Hello, Professor Mabubani. It's great to have you join us from Singapore. Thank you very much to come on our show. Now, let's begin with a few questions concerning China-U.S. relations. We know since the beginning of this year, China and the U.S. have had talks at the top diplomatic level. In July, President Xi Jinping had a phone call with U.S. President Joe Biden at the request of the latter. However, U.S. House Representative Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to China's Taiwan region last month violated the One China principle, and the Three China-U.S. joint communique rocked the political foundation of China-U.S. relations. Now, how do you evaluate? The current Sino-U.S. relationship. Are there new changes taking place between China and the U.S.? Well, you know, I'm very glad that、uh, President Xi and President Joe Biden had a phone conversation in July, as you mentioned, and I hope that they'll be able to meet、uh, in Bali at the G20 meeting if they both go there together. And the reason I say that is because U.S.-China relations. Have clearly become much, much worse、uh, in the past few years, and this is not driven by personalities. This is driven by a structural geopolitical logic, because two thousand years of history has taught us that whenever the world's number one emerging power, which today is China. Is about to become bigger in its economic size than the world's number one power, which today is United States. United States, the number one power, will always try to push down the world's number one emerging power. And so that structural logic is what is driving this downturn in U.S.-China relations. But of course, it can be made worse if you have irresponsible individuals. Uh, you know, doing act, carrying out actions that will make things worse. And so, for example, I think the visit of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi,、uh, to Taiwan was hugely irresponsible because she knew it would cause a lot of anger in China. It was completely unnecessary, and despite that, she went. And so that's the problem. Also, you have on the one hand. A structural logic pushing down U.S.-China relations, and then you have irresponsible individuals making it worse. So Beijing last month announced、um, eight countermeasures in response to Nancy Pelosi's highly provocative visit to China's Taiwan region, including cancelling China-U.S. theater commander talks, defense policy coordination, and suspending cooperation on illegal immigration, drug control, and climate change. 
Professor Mobani, you once said the fundamental interests of China and the U.S. are not contradictory. Now, do you think... It doesn't have to be a single winner. In fact, in the last chapter, I argue that there are five non-contradictions, non-contradictions between the United States and China, and the U.S. and China can achieve a win-win relationship where both China and the U.S. can benefit from this relationship. So, for example, as you know, the United States today is a deeply troubled place. You know, and you look at the latest issue of The Economist, and the cover of The Economist calls it the Disunited States of America. The Disunited States of America. So at a time when America is so divided, it'd be wiser for the American leaders to focus on improving the well-being of the American people. And that should be the number one priority of the American leaders. Now, to improve the well-being of the American people, the best way to do that is to work with China. And the best way to do that is to end the trade war with China. Because the trade war against China, as President Joe Biden himself said in the 2019 uh, election campaign, he said, these tariffs are hurting American workers, American consumers, American people. So Joe, President Joe Biden should remove these tariffs. And that will lead to a win-win outcome for US and China. But as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> In, given the current uh, political context within the United States of America, if President Joe Biden was to do the right thing, the reasonable thing, and lift tariffs on Chinese products, he would be killed politically. Sure. As you just mentioned, the U.S. President Joe Biden has been struggling indeed in the recent weeks to rebalance competing desires to use every way possible to ease high inflation domestically and to maintain pressure on Beijing on the issue of tariffs. But he hasn't been very decisive on removing tariffs on China. And you mentioned his considerations might be more political than economic. Yes, and indeed, you know, it's it, inflation is going to get worse uh, in the United States of America. And there are not many easy policy measures for the United States to take because, of course, they can, they can increase their interest rates, but if you increase the interest rates, you create an economic recession. So that's, very, that's, that's a big price you pay. But there's one easy measure that the United States can take to fight inflation, which is to remove tariffs uh, on Chinese products. And that will not just lower the costs of products for the working classes in America who are suffering, of, obviously, from inflation. At the same time, by removing these tariffs, it would send a positive signal uh, to the global economy and the global economic growth will, will get better. And if global economic growth gets better, then the condition of the American people will be better. This is the tragedy we face today that we all know what is the right thing to do to stop this trade war between the United States and China. That's the right thing to do. But American, no American politician dares to say this publicly. And this is the big tragedy in the US-China relationship. How do you see this is going to evolve? You picked up on the Cold War analogy, Professor Mababani, and this time you argued mm. the roles are seemingly reversed. The US is mm. the inflexible, ideological, systemically challenged superpower, while China, on the other hand, is adaptable, pragmatic, and strategically smart. Mm. You know, the, one of the main arguments that I make in my book is China won. And I say this as a friend of the United States, that the United States has made a huge strategic mistake in launching a geopolitical contest against China without working out a long-term strategy. And as I say in my book, that insight was given to me by the greatest living strategic thinker of the United States of America, whose name is Dr. Henry Kissinger. I had a one-on-one -on -one lunch with him in March uh, 2018, and this is what he said to me, and that's why I put it uh, in my book with his permission. 
So it is therefore important for the United States to step back and say, what are we trying to achieve with China? And I, and I, and I ask my American friends, I say, you've launched this contest. What are you trying to achieve? And I'll give you a simple example. Are you trying to stop the economic growth of China? It cannot be done. China's economy will continue to grow. Are you trying to overthrow the Communist Party of China? It cannot be done. The Communist Party of China has become most, more popular as docu documented by a Harvard Kennedy School study. And are you trying to isolate China as you know, United States successfully isolated the Soviet Union in the Cold War that you just uh, mentioned. It cannot be done because China trades more with the rest of the world than United States does. So the, the paradox here is that United States is supposed to be an open society which allows free debates on everything, but no one has had a serious debate about what are the objectives that the United States is trying to accomplish vis-a-vis -vis China. And in that sense, United States, as I say, is behaving like the former Soviet Union rather than behaving like United States did in the previous Cold War. And China, by contrast, does have a long-term strategy, is very clear about what it wants to accomplish. And therefore that gives China, in many ways, a competitive political advantage. Wipe 新加坡总理李显龙在国庆日上发表全国演讲窜台事件发生后李显龙更是频频喊话美国停止与中国发生冲突并拒绝加入所谓的民主国家联盟 Now recently Singapore Prime Minister Li Xianlong expressed his concern about China-US relations and other high Singaporean officials as well. Prime Minister used the Chinese phrase uh, Shan Yu Yu Lai Feng Man Lou to describe the current environment. And he said the differences between China and the US are deepening day by day. And Taiwan is one of the very important issues. How do you interpret his in statement? Well, I think the Prime Minister of Singapore is, is of course, seriously concerned uh, about the deterioration in the U.S.-China relations because he knows that a deterioration in the U.S.-China relationship won't just disrupt the ties between the United States and China. It will also affect every other country in the world because given the importance of the United States and China to the world economy. And that's why, you know, you know that the leaders of Singapore have been very consistent on the one hand in saying to both China and the United States, please find ways and means of working with each other. And at the same time, making it also very clear, countries like Singapore are not going to take sides in this US-China contest. They want to have good relations with the uh, United States and they want to have good relations with China. And I think that's the position, by the way, taken by most of the ASEAN uh, countries of Southeast Asia also. So I think the statements made by the Prime Minister of Singapore were intended to be helpful and intended to suggest a better way for United States and China to manage the current tensions in their relations. And before Nancy Pelosi visited uh, Taiwan, she actually chose Singapore as the first stop of her Asia mm. trip, um, also met with the Prime Minister Li Xianlong. So what role do you think Singapore in particular plays in the Sino-US relationship? 
Well, the, the honest answer is that Singapore is a very small country. <laughs> As you know, uh, China's population is 1.4 billion. Singapore's population is only 5 million. So Singapore is far too small uh, to be able to play any kind of important political role uh, in the US-China relationship. Of course, privately, I believe the Singapore leaders are trying to be helpful uh, in conveying uh, frank feedback to his two friends, uh, China and the United States. But I think Singapore will do nothing publicly or take any initiative because it is far too small to play a role in this difficult relationship between China and the US.自马凯硕表示，二十一世纪将见证亚洲重返世界舞台的中心，以及中国的和平崛起与全球秩序的重构。Professor Mabubani, you are an expert on Asia. You've been studying this uh, fast-growing continent for a long time, and you once said that Europe represents the past, the U.S. represents the present, and Asia represents the future. Tell us a bit more about this rebalancing of global power. Well, this is, of course, the, 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 the biggest shift that is happening in human history is the return of Asia. And it is now becoming clear that the whole world understands that this is the fundamental change taking place. I can tell you, it means that countries all around the world understand that the 21st century will be the Asian century and they want to understand what is happening on that front. But what is tragic about our world, our world's population, 12% lives in the West, 88% lives outside the West. The 88% outside the West understand that the artificial era of Western domination of world history is over and you're going to see the return of Asia. Unfortunately, there isn't a similar understanding of this in both North America and in Europe, because both North America and Europe are still trying to cling on to the privileges that they enjoyed from their domination of world history. So to give you a very simple example, in the year 2022, Right? We are 22 years in the 21st century. You still have a rule that says to become the head of the IMF, you must be a European. To become the head of the World Bank, you must be uh, American. Why should only representatives from 12% of the world's population still be allowed to dominate the two most powerful international economic organizations. That's an anachronism. That's, that's what the, a relic from the past. But the West refuses to give up its control of these international organizations. And I argue, in many of my books I've argued, it'd be wiser for the West to accept the return of Asia and to work with Asia in a cooperative leadership. Uh, of the world, and then you create a more stable world order. Thank you very much, Professor Mabubani. You were Singapore's permanent representative to the UN, and you were also the president of the UN Security Council between 2001 to 2002. How would you evaluate China's efforts in global governance over the past few decades? I would say that the world should be grateful that
weakening the 1945 rules-based order, that is actually one of the huge paradoxes of our time, that the United States, which created the UN, is weakening it. China, which, is, which did not create the UN, is strengthening it. And that's a paradox. What role do you think China plays in the new international order? moving closer and closer to these multilateral institutions? We are moving from a unipolar world, a unicivilizational world, to a multipolar, multi-civilizational world. And in the area of multiple successful civilizations, China can promote a dialogue of civilizations among different civilizations. And of course, Chinese civilization, as we know, has clearly been one of the most successful civilizations in human history for 4,000 years or more. So therefore, China has the cultural confidence that other civilizations don't have. And so China can take the lead in promoting a multi-civilizational dialogue. And I think if China can do that, it will create a better and a safer world for all of us. That's a great concluding remark. Professor Mabobani, thank you very much for being on our show. Let's keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me.